From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We are joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deccant. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this stuff they don't want you to know. Today's episode, spoiler alert, is about more than one conspiracy. We are exploring a rat's nest, or a rat king, Uh, of interlinked events. These are things that at a cursory glance might seem like isolated, tragic cases of a lone wolf or what are sometimes called bad apples. However, as we are going to find out very shortly, each of these cases turns out to be the facet of something much, much larger and something incredibly dangerous. Because you see, folks, it turns out that the U.S. military may be training the domestic terrorist of the future. Oh, boy. Yeah. That's, I mean, have you guys, we talked about this, you know, like Timothy McVeigh and um, various groups that aim for insurrection or they want to secede from the nation. I think there was a stat we learned years ago that uh, at any given time, there are at least a hundred secessionist groups of varying seriousness in the U.S. alone. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there are, and I, I guess the big question is how much has the military itself been infiltrated by groups like this, right? Or how often have these groups used the military as a tool for training? Exactly. Here are. The facts. So the U.S. military was segregated for a long time. It was desegregated in 1948, which in the span of history still isn't really that long ago. Uh, After it was formally desegregated, there were still segregated military units until 1954, the same time that uh, Bernays convinced America to uh, help United Fruit (laughs) with a coup in Guatemala. Uh, That's the same year that these final segregated units were disbanded. And now, even though it might not occur to a lot of people outside of the military, the U.S. military is one of the most ethnically diverse and integrated institutions in the entire country. It's it's crazy uh, when you think about it. Yeah, and, and, you know, no matter where an individual comes from, no matter what beliefs an individual has, uh, this person, this individual has to work with so many other people um, in order to to make any unit function within the military. You, you just have to, you have to do that to function, at least in a mechanical way, right? And the United States Department of Defense has actually prohibited members of the military um, from any kind of active participation in, you know, hate groups, white supremacist groups, uh, any other extremist groups since 1996. And this is, you may recognize this, we already mentioned his name in the episode. That's when the decorated Gulf War veteran and white supremacist Timothy McVeigh carried out the Oklahoma City bombing. And you can you can understand why an event like that would cause action on, you know, a, a an entire institution wide basis. Absolutely. I mean, because, of, of course, the armed services has sort of safeguards in place that prohibit sort of what you might consider at the very basic level conflicts of interest, you know, prohibition of uh, members being members of other groups whose goals and, uh, I guess, moral codes could run counter to the goals of the military or the nation at large. For example, you wouldn't want uh, members of an army to also be a member of another army, of another nation. I mean, that's the most basic way of thinking about it. You wouldn't want someone on a counterterrorism initiative also being in a terrorist group. It seems silly, but this is the most cut and dry way of thinking about it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, look, as of 2020, there are well over 
a million active duty personnel in the military. They come from all over the country, have all like a wide range of different beliefs, socioeconomic situations, and so on. Uh, these are people who, in many cases, wouldn't hang out with each other for fun. You know what I mean? It's, it's, they may have never even had the chance to meet each other. So we have to, as, as you guys point out, we have to have a cohesive, structure and we have to make sure that the people in that structure the individual links in the chain are all working toward the same common goal so that's why you don't want someone who's working in counterterrorism moonlighting as a terrorist uh, that's that's why you don't want people who are ostensibly fighting for equality or or representing the goals and values of this nation to also be members of groups that object to equality or object to the goals of a nation. And so, so each branch of the military has these kind of equal opportunity manuals that specifically prohibit service members from joining things like the KKK or neo-Nazi groups or other extremist organizations. And troops who were caught with ties to white nationalism are typically going to be punished by their commanders for violating one of two things. It's either going to be Article 92 of the Uniform Code of Military Justice, or they can be punished under Article 134 for engaging in conduct that is generally considered discrediting and prejudicial to good order and discipline. And I would assume like on, on the worst case side, that would be a court martial and like a dishonorable discharge. But I'm sure there's slap on the wrist versions of this kind of punishment as well, right? Oh, man, it goes. Yeah, to say the least. Yeah, there's a variance. Um, and, and, and let's talk about that. Let's actually look at some examples here. And we'll, we'll give you a couple quotes that are directly from the Army, or this is at least one directly from the Army. Quote, participation in extremist organizations and activities by Army personnel is inconsistent with the responsibilities of military service. It is the policy of the United States Army to provide equal opportunity and treatment for all soldiers without regard to race, color, religion, gender, or national origin. Enforcement of this policy is a responsibility of command, is vitally important to unit cohesion and morale, and is essential to the Army's ability to accomplish its mission. Oh, that PR person did a good job. I mean, it does. It does. It reads as PR, right? Oh, um, a million percent. And it, it has to be written that way, honestly. Mm hmm. Agreed. Well, let's talk about how they define extremist groups. Uh, Get again, ready for some more breathtaking literature. <laughs> you ready? Again, this is, this is from the Army. Here we go. Organizations and activities are ones that advocate racial, gender, or ethnic hatred or intolerance, advocate, create, or engage in illegal discrimination based on race, color, gender, religion, or national origin, or advocate the use of force or violence or unlawful means to deprive individuals of their rights under the United States Constitution or the laws of the United States or any state by unlawful means. Okay. Snooze fest, huh? I, I, I mean, I, I, I'm sorry. I'm struck by everything in there except the part that says in the United States Constitution or the laws of the United States could be describing the military itself. Oh, <laughs> like that. The, I mean, oh, yeah, especially well, yeah. the gender front. There's, I, I think, there's some sand to what you're saying, but I, I don't think uh, racial or ethnic hatred. At least well, in I don't know. I mean, we we hate our enemies, and some of them are racially different than us. You know, I mean, I, I, I again, I'm sorry, I'm I'm overstating the case a little bit, but you know, I mean, if you think of people in the Middle East, I mean, there's certainly an ingrained distrust and dare I say hatred for people that look a certain way. You know, uh, that I feel like people come out of you know uh, conflicts in those countries, perhaps with those kinds of feelings. I don't, I don't know. I'm sure it's not everybody. It's, it's weird, man, because do you notice that what we talked about in that paragraph before, um, enforcement of this policy is a responsibility of command, right? Now that right. phrase alone means you're going to get varying results depending on who is command. Who is this command? It, <laughs> this is going to be very important later, but mm -hmm. look, Folks, government manuals are probably never going to win a Pulitzer. 
but they do make an important point. And let's let's put it bluntly. Let's get past the the jargon and the buzzwords here. Uncle Sam is essentially saying, look, if we want people to work together, we just can't have racists in the mix. They are the weak link in the chain and they are going to be undependable when hits the fan because racism indicates uh, a number of things. Uh, One of the first things it indicates is a lack of critical thinking skills, which can be taught. Uh, But uh, one of the second things it indicates is a, a, a strong uh, emotive reaction rather than a logical one. So they're not people you want on the team. No. Let me quickly walk back my little cute comment that I made. I am not in any way implying that the military at large is a inherently racist organization or that anyone who serves in the military comes away with racist ideas in any way, shape, or form. I just, the, again, it was more a response to the absurd PR-ness of this kind of writing. Well, historically, too, no, uh, I think your your point could hold because consider all of the heavily racially charged propaganda of World War II and, and wars of yesteryear. Service members were encouraged uh, to have uh, incredibly prejudicial attitudes, and they were indoctrinated to a large degree. As recently as Vietnam. I mean, you know, the idea of Dude, Charlie and you know, the Gulf all that War. Stuff. Of course. Uh, uh, operations in Afghanistan. Um, we, we've talked about before on this show that the othering that occurs there is almost a necessity to, to the mission to, to, well, to get the mindset to, to instill within an individual, the mindset that the person you're shooting at is, is less than human is not a, you know, a, a person with a family with feelings and all those things. Right. I mean, it's, it's necessary We've, we've talked before about how difficult it is to get an individual soldier to actually fire at with intent to kill an enemy combatant. That's not an easy thing to get into somebody's head. It shouldn't yeah. be, for no. sure. Well, uh, it, it, yeah, no, I agree it shouldn't be, but it's it's not. like it. It is not an easy thing to do, so you have to use tactics like what we're discussing here to, mm. to push, push it over the line, basically. While at the same time... Uh, somehow drawing a clear line of demarcation and saying the people you work with, the people you serve with, have to be treated as equals. Despite all of the stuff we're telling you about people you're fighting. Uh, Anyway, it turns out these policies may be fantastic on paper, but they are not as effective in practice. And that is a massive understatement on my part. So the question today is what exactly is going on with supremacists in the military? Here's where it gets crazy. There's quite a lot going on, actually, with uh, white supremacists in particular in the military. Let's consider the case of one Christopher Hassan. He is. Uh, he was a former U.S. Coast Guard lieutenant just this January 2020. He was sentenced to more than 13 years uh, of prison for federal-level drug and gun crimes. He was also planning to commit mass murder, a serial series of murders against various politicians and uh, journalists that he did not care for. He was a self-described white nationalist. He had served in the Marine Corps from 88 to 93. He became a corporal. He'd also been in the National Guard before joining the Coast Guard. I mean, this this guy was in the system, and the entire time he was serving in these roles, he was radicalizing. He was reading white power manifestos online. He was compiling this hit list. Uh, the uh, the Alphabet Soup guys pulled his search histories, and they're – very not subtle. <laughs> They're like, where, where is best place to live? D.C. Democratic senators, D.C. Do senators have protection? D.C. Good well, deal yeah. on C four, mm. right? Well, yeah, and his his hit list was was an actual list of hits, right? And it was focused on, uh, I guess, dem- Democratic senators and other politicians that he that he thought would be good targets, I guess due to his views, like who were in opposition to him. Yeah. And he was unstable. I mean, he wasn't, the thing is with 
folks who reach this this level of I would call it disassociation or bubbling, uh, the goals or the aims become increasingly disconnected from reality, by which I mean the things they want to do become increasingly different from the things they could realistically pull off. He wanted to turn the Pacific Northwest into an all-white homeland. You know, like the good old days. (laughs) which is how Oregon is founded. That is true. Uh, He wanted to use biological weapons to, and this is a direct quote, kill almost every last person on earth. That's a bit extreme. That's also a tall order. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. Was he a part of an organization or was he acting alone with all of this research he was doing? And like, was he linked up with anyone? Are we aware of that? It's a good question because I am not directly aware of prominent membership in things, but we have to understand the concept of membership has evolved with the rise of social media. If you are a mod on a forum for neo-Nazis, that means you're probably a neo-Nazi, right? Or you work for the FBI, but does it mean (laughs) uh, that you are a member of, you know, uh, Stormfront or something like that? Not necessarily. It's tricky. But the the thing is about this guy, he was caught before he was able to carry out any of these planned assassinations or attacks. And there are more Christopher Hassans out there. There are many, many more than you might think. And some don't wait to get booted out to join a supremacist organization. I'd love to, if we can, just briefly talk about... Um, one of the strangest uh, racist or I guess you could call them supremacist organizations uh, that have infiltrated in some part uh, the U.S. military. We we did an episode on this previously, but I'm still I'm still fascinated and very confused by this group. OK, so let's think about another case, uh, the case of U.S. Army Private Ethan Melzer, who enlisted in 2018 and uh, was deployed in October of 2019. He was radicalized by reading propaganda from things like the organization you're talking about, the Order of the Nine Angles. And while he was deployed, he um, had designs on orchestrating an ambush of his own unit, sending intel about the unit to an alleged member of Al-Qaeda. What? That's a lot. Yeah. He sent texts, mind you, to an O9A thread arguing his military training, survival, and links to other groups could be an asset. If this was over Telegram, the uh, the messaging service, uh, we have Telegram? Sta- yeah, yeah. Uh, we have the statement from, in part, from a press release by Audrey Strauss, the acting U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York. And Strauss walks us through the ins and outs of how Melzer attempted to sell out his unit. And here's what she had to say. Melzer allegedly attempted to orchestrate a murderous ambush on his own unit by unlawfully revealing its location, strength, and armaments to a neo-Nazi anarchist white supremacist group. Melzer allegedly provided this potentially deadly information intending that it be conveyed to jihadist terrorists. As alleged, Melzer was motivated by racism and hatred as he attempted to carry out this ultimate act of betrayal. And as you might recognize from previous episodes, uh, the Order of the Nine Angles is not, I guess you can't call them your garden variety white power group. They're they wouldn't call themselves a cult, but they, they do a lot of culty stuff. Uh, they practice what's known as left hand magic, and uh, they're into some real, their beliefs are really disturbing, but they're really confusing. Uh, please dive into that rabbit hole, find our previous episode. Uh, and then do your own just, research for sure. Yes. It, like Ben said, it's confusing and, and it's difficult to decipher from the outside. So, uh, yeah, just. 
Is left hand out. magic like when you make coins disappear and stuff? Or oh no no no, no. that's right hand magic. Okay. Left hand magic is like the the curse your family, the seventh generation, the all the stuff you hear about. Uh, you hear people being accused of in witch trials. Of oh, I mean, that, that, I'd take offense to that as a left handed person. Is the left hand like the evil hand? Uh, yeah, historically dude. in culture, yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> it's lefties not, it's not and redheads just really get shit on. We're all in that boat. So, also, uh, a, a huge uh, percentage of U.S. presidents are left-handed. So it's 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 a rare and noble trait, I would say. And the people, uh, it, the people in civilizations past, with their discrimination, were just. Being dicks. Don't it's worry. A, Brush them a, off. It's okay. It's, it's less and less actually figures into my day-to-day life as I very rarely write things with a an implement, and I do everything else right-handed, so no one would know unless you see me, like, sign a credit card receipt or something. Yeah. I mean, I I feel you, man. I'm I'm technically ambidextrous, but I I love that point you make. How many people do write longhand it would be called our buddy Maybe. alex williams does he, uh, he keeps a little notepad with him and anytime you give him a recommendation or a suggestion for something to read or listen to he always jots it down i find it charming that's Techni- what I technically too. i'm tridextrous but we can talk about that later i'm a big fan of writing longhand i think it helps your brain process things differently than typing so i encourage everybody like you can't see off camera but i have just piles of weird notebooks and stuff uh so the and moleskines which are overpriced but i still love them it's nostalgia anyhow Thankfully they end up in a lot of swag bags so i do have a few moleskines laying around from giveaways Wait, it's, and- it's not moleskin it's moleskine I clearly you know, haven't, I, think haven't. The, I, think, I honestly think the jury's still out on that. I've heard I've heard it said both ways. I like to say moleskin just because it sounds fun and it's a nonsensical thing, whereas we know what moleskin is. But I don't know. What do you think, Ben? I just clearly haven't had enough in my life. I need to get more in my life. I think so. Right. I know. Well, act surprised uh, when when the holidays come around, Matt. Also, I just think moleskin feels kind of gross yeah a little you bit a little bit <laughs> but uh speaking of gross things what is the scope of this conspiracy are these indeed just a few bad apples it's a question we'll a- answer after we pause for a word from our sponsor <laughs> And we're back. So let's look at a survey from 2019. It was from readers of Military Times. This is an independent news outlet, that, and uh, this is what they found. More than 36% of active duty troops surveyed said they had personally witnessed examples of white nationalism or ideological driven racism within the ranks in recent months. And that was a 14% increase from a similar survey that was done the year before in 2018. And then in June of this year, something interesting came the way of Congress. Military officials, they drew a line between active participation and, quote, mere membership. Those are two quotes there. Active participation versus mere membership. The officials said mere membership in white supremacist groups is, quote, not prohibited. For American service members, but active participation, and this is defined as, you know, going to a rally, going to a fundraising uh, event or fundraising yourself for a racist group, that is wrong. But if you're just, you know, if you're just in the club, eh, what are we going to do? That's essentially what what was told to Congress. Yeah, but what does that mean? If you if you think about that, like uh, I was trying to figure out a good example of this, so Say, for instance, uh, so I have a fun example and I have a disturbing one. All right. The fun example would be like, uh, I, I don't know, who's a who, who's a quirky celebrity, like a niche celebrity or musician you guys like? Zach Galifianakis. Perfect. Thank you. So Zach Galifianakis, uh, let's say you are in the Zach Galifianakis fan club, right? And you have joined the fan club. 
you have a little card that says Zach Galifianakis Fan Club. Uh, they send you a swag bag with your Zach Galifianakis Moleskeen uh, and your T-shirt and maybe some like branded Provolactics or something. Copy of uh, the Hangover 2 on DVD, perhaps? Mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm. and they say Zach Galifianakis on it. Yes! That's yes, the name of the group. Oh, I love that. Yeah. That's genius, yes. Matt. We yes, they this. do. Yes, they do, Matt. So uh, you are a member of the Zach Gala Fanatics, and you have the swag bag. Uh, and then someone says, hey, uh, you don't actually like Zach Gala Fanatics, do you? Poser. Then, Get out. <laughs> and then you say, no, no. Why would I? Look, it's just my right as an American. It's free speech uh, for me to be a member of this group. But I would never... Uh, buy a DVD of his work. I would never go to a Zach Galifianakis show. I'm just I would never get this tattoo of his character from Dinner for Schmucks. <laughs> right, that's not exactly. that's not there. <laughs> so that's that's the you see how that line between just being whoosh, whoosh, a member and being active is very very troubling because the dis, uh, disturbing example would be something like. Uh, People who join those pro uh, child abuse networks, those pro pedophilia networks like NAMBLA or something, uh, they can say, oh, I'm just a member, but it's gross, <laughs> you know? <laughs> that, uh, just imagining somebody saying that, I, I'm just a member of NAMBLA, what? I mean, you could make the argument that you're infiltrating the network of pedophiles and Zach Gala fanatics. You know, Jesus. Uh, those are two, okay, to be to be clear, those are two separate things. Those are two separate things. Um, but you know, that could be the argument you're making, or you're just checking it out, just seeing like like uh, you know, like in Fight Club, where the dude goes to uh, what is it like bereavement meetings mm-hmm. um, or, or, or what are they like Narcotics Anonymous type things, sex sex addict meetings. That's what it is. And there's a real life analog of that argument, none other than Pete Townsend of The Who. You remember that uh, when he said that when he was caught studying depictions of child abuse, uh, he oh, said, I don't it, remember that. I, I vaguely remember that. Yeah. He said it was uh, research to take Pete. down the pedos. So. You see how that that gets sticky in the in the idea. We can say all the live long day that someone is just a member of an extremist group for some reason, and the question is, at what point? Like, what is the difference between actively supporting something and passively being a member of it? We'll uh, we'll look forward to hearing your stance on this, Zach Gala fanatics. <laughs> there's there's something else that happens. So there there are two things we talked about. That guy in the order of the nine angles, he was like in his early twenties when this happened. Uh, at which point, of course, there is the psychological argument that the brain is not fully formed, which does have some sand to it. But we what we need to talk about also would be veterans. They play a big part in this conspiracy. Some veterans, a very small percentage of veterans. Veterans have held leadership roles in some of the most prominent, some of the most well-known white supremacist groups. Investigative journalists are still uncovering new members of violent racist groups who are also current members of the Army, the Marine Corps, Air Force, and so on. Uh, But just another snapshot, the same month that Hassan was convicted in 2020, January, a U.S. Army vet and a former combat engineer from the Canadian Army Reserve were found to be alleged members of a neo-Nazi group known as The Base. The Base may be familiar to some of us because prosecutors say The Base was discussing plans to create violence at a pro-gun rally in Virginia with the ultimate aim of sparking a civil war. Wow. It's still hard to, for me to wrap my head around that being the end goal for some of these groups. But we know it. Historically, that has been one of the, one of the reasons for joining, joining a group like this and for the existence of a group like this is to uh, foment. Like one of the first things is to foment a civil war. Let's get a civil war going on so we can then go in through the ashes of the country and rebuild it as we see fit. Ugh. 
Uh, and, and, you know, without putting too fine a political point on it, it starts to feel like the idea of these Proud Boys and some of these groups that we're seeing today could be that thing, you know, the kind of foot soldiers in the streets sort of trying to foment that civil war and uh, bringing the war home or, or whatever and trying mm. to, you know, shut down the, the libs, literally. Yeah, and, you know, there's an author, there are numerous authors, one in particular, uh, who would agree with that point. Kathleen Bellew, who is the author of a book called Bring the War Home, notes that uh, U.S. veterans have played key roles in white supremacist movements in the United States for more than 100 years. I mean, the Ku Klux Klan had new waves of resurgence after both world wars, after the Vietnam War. Also, it was founded by a group of Confederate veterans. This author sees similarities, just like you pointed out, in the recent wave of alt-right white supremacist organizing and she says that this has been shaped to a great degree by America's war on terror in the Middle East. And we we see something interesting here because, again, the U.S. military is trying to uh, to filter out racist in in the recruiting process. And this has led some supremacist groups to adopt a different strategy to encourage young members to join the U.S. military because of the training and the access to weapons that they will gain. And then they can use that access and use that expertise to teach other members of the organizations after they leave the service or uh, during their time. In the service, maybe even actively recruit uh, vulnerable people who are serving with them. Man, that's pretty disturbing. Again, using the military as a training and weapons acquisition opportunity. And and just one thing to just put a point on there: we are talking specifically about uh, white supremacist groups and organizations and individuals who have been, you know, using this tactic, but. Like we said in the beginning, this applies to any hate-based or um, uh, d- discriminatory-based organization or group, right? Um, it, it's, it could be anything. And it really is just, I mean, just even talking about this, this is a super touchy subject um, in the concept of the military being used in this way. And unfortunately, there have been attempts and, and plans put in place to fix this problem. But as we've seen in the past and we will continue to see in the future, unless there's a massive change, taking action from, you know, politicians within the United States, specifically within Congress to actually write a bill or, you know, something to fix this issue, to change something. It's been difficult uh, historically and again, probably in the future. In 2009, under the Obama administration, there were Republican members of Congress, and they were essentially attempting to get the Department of Homeland Security chief to apologize after there was an intelligence briefing that warned about some of this stuff, that the U.S. military veterans of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan would be vulnerable to some type of radicalization by white supremacists and by anti-government groups and some of the alt-right uh, more extremist splinter groups that we've seen. Yeah, and it was a good flag to raise on the side of Homeland Security because they're just they're conveying what they find in an intelligence briefing. Uh, the reaction from the the reaction from those who objected to this characterization or this intelligence briefing. Uh, they were really reacting to what they saw as something that was somehow offensive or an attack on conservative identifying people at large. And they said, well, this way, what is it? This implies that all conservatives are somehow a bigger threat to the U S than Al Qaeda, which is incredible, like cartoonishly misleading. It is so clear that, supremacist and conservative people are not the same because just because you might have a more conservative view on something like how much you should pay in taxes, right? That doesn't automatically mean 
that same person is somehow pro genocide. It's it's frankly kind of ridiculous that we would even have to spell that out here. Uh, but that's some of the um, vitriol that 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 was happening, and there was a bit of an appeal to emotion. But well, yeah, and I would just add add to that just because someone would view themselves as morally conservative even has no correlation with with these other hate groups there's absolutely zero correlation don't ever let yourself believe that no matter what you read on you know whatever social media outlet you're looking at um just just be aware that's all yeah again you know it's the danger of the broad brush uh, which is very convenient uh, for many powerful organizations, the media included. So while objecting to that intelligence briefing may have been um, a good short-term move for the politicians in question, you know, get them some headlines, get them some column space in the newspapers of note, in the long term, it was not. It's not a helpful thing because the problem is real, and the problem seems to be increasing. When we talk about this conspiracy, if you look at cases of white nationalism in the U.S. military since the attacks on September 11th, 2001, you are going to find dozens and dozens of cases of white nationalists in the military, and these are just the examples of troops who have been caught who have been written about in the media and have been disciplined or punished. And if we think about that earlier poll, if more than one in three troops today have witnessed something like this in the ranks, then we have to, we have to think along the lines of the uh, excellent article written by David Christinger for warhorse.org, where he asked how many White nationalists in the military don't just slip through the cracks during the recruitment process. How many also remain undetected, unaccounted for, and unpunished? And he has a quote here that I think I think sums up the problem really well. Yes. And Chrisinger writes this. Quote, the truth is that no one knows how prevalent white nationalism is in the U.S. military. During a hearing of the House Armed Services Subcommittee on Military Personnel in February 2020, representatives of Naval Criminal Investigative Service and the Army's Criminal Investigation Division testified they had no reliable data on how many troops have been administratively discharged for promoting white supremacist ideologies. Um, the Marine Corps which has seen its fair share of white nationalism among its ranks, does not track the number of Marines it discharges for ties to white nationalist groups. So this goes back to that question I asked at the top of the show, right? Like, is, is, is there a slap on the wrist version of this punishment that we're talking about? It would seem so. Oh, it would seem way so. And we'll talk more about that after a quick word from our sponsor. And we're back. So in this episode, we've been setting up a couple of things that have been alluded to, that have been foreshadowed. I'd like to present one of the biggest problems with this. So one of the problems, uh, as Christinger put so succinctly, is that parts of the military that should be keeping track of this stuff are not. For one reason or another, maybe they've been prevented from doing so. Maybe there's just red tape in the way. It reminds me of the FBI's weird blind spot when it comes to tallying disappearances in public parks. Now we have to talk about the other problem, which is punishment. Matt, as you mentioned in the earlier quote from the military's operations manual, the severity of a of punishment or discipline that a white nationalist receives and whether they're punished at all depends entirely on their commanders. And those commanders typically are going to have almost a hundred percent discretion over how any violation is investigated, uh, prosecuted or educated. So to know the full extent of the supremacist infiltration occurring the DOD would have to do something like this. They would have to go back and see uh, how many people violated Articles 92 and 134. They would have to add those numbers together. 
But those numbers, again, only include the people who were caught and disciplined. So it leaves out anyone who was caught and reported to their commander, uh, but then had their commander say, I don't know, know, we have bigger fish to fry. I don't know if we need to investigate this or discipline this person. Maybe we just tell them, stop. Mm -hmm. But it does make you wonder... Who's watching the watchman? Who's looking at the commanders to make sure they're above board? According to Carter F. Smith, he's a former criminal investigator. Currently, he's a criminal justice instructor at Middle Tennessee University, Middle Tennessee State University. Uh, According to him, military officials always say the number of actual white nationalists in the ranks are small. And because of that, because they're such a small slice of the demographic, they're not really a priority. And Carter's objection is this. He says, okay, fine, maybe the number is small, but it's like saying it's a small dose of poison. He says, you know, they're like a drop of cyanide in your drink. They're not the majority of the liquid, but they can still do a lot of damage. And I think that is a very, very good point. And I want to emphasize something here. Uh, Matt, I think you may have mentioned this earlier, but extremism is a danger in all forms. And there's a reason that we're talking primarily about white nationalist groups today. They receive the most attention. Uh, They've been linked to the uh, the highest number of attempted or successfully carried out terrorist attacks domestically in the U.S., like in this genre of uh, terrorism and extremism. But other supremacist groups exist. They, they exist, and they, uh, they have used some of the same strategies. You recruit alienated people in the rank and file. You recruit isolated veterans who feel like they're, they're kind of lost after getting out of the service, and you use them as tools. You radicalize them, and you uh, make them a puppet for your agenda, and make no mistake, you throw them away when you're done. That's that's something that I think isn't emphasized enough for the military members who experience this stuff firsthand. White nationalism in particular stands out the most frequently. So this is not this is not uh, us editorializing or, quote unquote, picking on a specific genre of hate group. Uh, This is this is coming from firsthand reports from troops like the troops who responded to that poll we mentioned earlier cited white nationalism as a greater national security threat than domestic terrorism with a connection to Islam or immigration. So obviously, the military does not want racist recruits. Uh, This is hopefully not not a hot take, but racism is a defect. It's a defect of the mind that would render someone unable to serve to the fullest extent of their physical fitness and their mental ability. So obviously the military doesn't want that. However, it doesn't have a a solid foolproof system for screening those folks out in the first place. Recruits go through a criminal background check when they enlist, of course, but this only detects, like we said, extremist membership if they've been charged with a crime relating to those kind of beliefs. And the vetting system still doesn't really address social media. And social media is where a huge deal of modern radicalization and hate group recruitment occurs. You know what I mean? The Zach Gala fanatics exist online. Uh, they don't have a physical clubhouse. And again, I'm not calling the Zach Gala fanatics a hate group. Uh, I think they do very good work, and I'm <laughs> I'm a big fan of uh, Gala Fan Con, so I, I hope to see everybody there next year. I often do rituals uh, reading from the Gala Fan Necronomicon. Yes, yeah, it's it's uh it's it's pretty it's a pretty comprehensive book, you know. Of, uh, of, dare uh, we say a tome, sir? Mm-hmm. Uh, a grimoire, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. of uh, sorts. Yes, a smirkwa. Anyway, so oh gosh. Uh, so this uh, this means that the government has a lot to do. Uh, it's got a lot of work ahead of it in terms of how to address this. There are multiple studies by multiple government entities 
and nonprofit institutions exploring this issue. The findings are a subject of ongoing debate, and rightly so, because the reality is that people know there is a conspiracy here, but there is no foolproof way yet to stop this infiltration which is in what it is in some cases. And there's no foolproof way to prevent individuals with high level military training from, you know, leaving the service and then going on to train members of your local hate group. Like, how would you, how would you even begin to legislate that? Right. Tell somebody, look, I know that you have learned all these things. Now, uh, I have to write a law somehow that's that restricts at every moment in your life, your ability to use that experience or teach those things. You know what I mean? It's, it's very difficult. Yeah. I mean, I really don't, I don't know how you, how you fix it. And I wonder if the way, the way you fix it is to use PR to make it seem like the problem is not so bad. But I guess that would mean you're not actually fixing it. You're just making it look as though it's not uh, such a problem. I don't know. That's that's weird, man. And it's strange because you know we have we have a lot of uh, veterans who are fellow listeners. We have a lot of family members and friends who have been or are currently serving in the military. And uh, in the course of my research for this, I, I talked to some folks just off the record, you know, give me your take, what's going on. And uh, I, the responses I got, you know, said that this is a very real thing. Uh, and <laughs> one of the, uh, I'm laughing about serious subject because one of the responses I got uh, from a person I won't identify was just hilarious. They were like, I hate those people. They're bad at their jobs. And I, I said, well, that's the number, the number one problem you have. And, and this person said, well, I look, yeah. Okay. Their beliefs are, are terrible, but also their beliefs are, uh, are a symptom of the fact that they're not intelligent and they're bad at their jobs and them being bad at their jobs is what really annoys me on a day-to-day well, basis. <laughs> it's just to your point earlier, Ben, at the very top of the show, it kind of points to a certain lack of critical thinking abilities and this sort of need to oversimplify problems and hang them on a particular group uh, when clearly it's a much larger issue than that. And it's just such a leap of logic that these folks are able to do that it really just kind of makes me think they're not particularly bright. I'm sorry, that's about the, the, the shape of it there. Yeah, and I'm I'm tempted. Hence, not uh, good at their jobs. I guess is what I'm getting at. <laughs> right. You know? yeah. I, and I'm you know I'm I'm tempted to agree. Racism is learned. It's something that can be unlearned, uh, and it's something that people have to have to work through. the The issue here is the infiltration of in one of the most in the most powerful military force on the planet. You know what I mean? Uh, this is this is dangerous when we think that the most powerful military in the world may be unwittingly training the people who want to destroy the country this military serves. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm. Like the, the call is coming from inside the house, as they say in horror stories. And it's J. Edgar Hoover. <laughs> and, he, did, and imagine, he didn't help things he didn't help things and imagine you know there are so many brilliant people in the military there's so many people who joined the services uh because it represented an opportunity that would not have otherwise been available right and these people are doing incredibly important work and stuff like this extremist groups and infiltration this kind of stuff uh should be offensive to every member of the military so uh, as we reach the conclusion here, we really want to know your experience, we, uh, if, especially if you've been in active military duty in, in any branch. We just want to hear what you've, what you've seen while you were there and what you think about this whole problem. 
And of course, thank you for your service so much. I mean, yeah. I hope none of this came off as us like ragging on the military. I mean, it's obviously a important and valuable institution. And like many important and valuable institutions, there are inherent problems sometimes, but it doesn't you know, mean, you know, that whole idea of bad apples, you know, uh, that's what we're talking about here. It's such a, a ridiculous uh, term as what is it? Chris Rock talking about bad apples uh, in the police force. Like we, or we call them bad apples if they're pilots, you know, there's a couple of bad apples crashing planes all the time. You know, it's an interesting way of looking at it, but absolutely very much value um, our military uh, members, and we particularly want to hear from you because we know there are folks that are in this that are seeing this firsthand and let us know what that's like and how it affects you, how it affects day to day operations. Is it something you have to tiptoe around? Is it in leadership? Let us know. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter where we are Conspiracy Stuff. On Instagram, we are Conspiracy Stuff Show. If you don't want to do those things, we have a number you can call. What? Use your phone as a phone? Crazy. Our number is 1-833-STDWYTK. Leave us a message. Tell us, uh, tell us your experience. Tell us about an episode you'd like to see us cover or anything else. But especially, let us know if you're okay with us using your name if the message gets played on air in one of our listener mail episodes. Hold your horses, you might be saying. A phone call in 2020? Perish the thought. And perish the thought of social media as well. Uh, if you are having those thoughts race through the twisted halls of your mind and bounce around in your subconscious and you have something to say but you need a, a, an easier way to say it to us we have good news for you we have an old-fashioned email address you can reach us anytime wherever you are whomever you are all you have to do is drop us a line where we are conspiracy at iheartradio.com Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.